Well, hello there. Welcome to the Pacific War Channel again. This is the channel where we cover the Asia-Pacific War from 1937 to 1945. And this will be another book review. How exciting, I hope for the audience. This time we're going to be talking about Osprey Publishing, Men at Arms series, 505, Imperial Chinese Armies, 1840 to 1911. Written by Philip S. Jowett and Jerry Ambleton. Published in 2016 by Osprey Publishing. Uh, to start off, it's available on Kindle and paperback. Unfortunately, it's not on Audible, but that's understandable based on the format and the writing style. It wouldn't make sense as an Audible book. Let's start off a little bit about the authors. Philip S. Jowett was born in Leeds, England in 1961. He's been interested in military history since as long as he can remember. His major breakthroughs was Osprey Publishing's Men at Arms series, 306, Chinese Civil War Armies, 1911 to 1949. Since then, he's published well over 50 books, 30 of which are under Osprey Publishing, and he has many standalones such as Liberty or Die, Latin American Conflicts 1900 to 1970, Rising Sun at War, the Japanese Army 1931 to 1945, China and Japan at War 1937 to 1945, to just name a few. He is a rugby league enthusiast and an amateur genealogist who lives and is married in Lincolnshire. I honestly have to admit I could not investigate his educational background for the life of me. Nor did I find any mention of him graduating from a university nor being a professor anywhere. I assume he is a freelance historian, and that's actually pretty cool. Jerry Ambleton is the artist, and he began his career as a comic strip artist working for TV Century 21 in the 1960s. He later worked in children's educational illustrations as well as advertising. He is best known for his illustrative work with military and historic subjects. He's illustrated over 40 titles for Osprey Publishing alone. He now lives in Prales, Switzerland, and was born originally in London, England. Having said that, because of him, more general readers can use this book with its clear subheadings and clear index with splendid illustrations. So a short summary of the book. The first part of the book summarizes the extremely complex period of 1840 to 1911 for Chinese military history. The vast majority is a summarization of the amount of internal rebellions that were going on and a few wars with the Qing Dynasty um, involving the British, French, USA, and Japan later on. The second part of the book goes into a deep analysis of the weapons, equipment, clothing, tactics, strategy, and overall structure of the Qing Dynasty's military. This is all accompanied by Osprey publishing signature artwork and photography to really give it life you know, for the places, the people, and the events. A review of the book now. The first part of the book, as I had mentioned, covers the history of the Qing Dynasty between 1840 and 1911, as far as rebellions are concerned and wars. Uh, just to give you an idea of how unbelievably complex this time period is, with just rebellions alone, here are the events that occurred. The Triad Revolt that devastated Guangxi and Guangtong provinces from October 1850 to March 1853. The Taiping Rebellion of 1850 to 1864. The Small Sword Society Uprising of 1853 to 1855. The Panthai Revolt of 1855 to 1873. The Red Turban Revolt of 1854 to 1856. The Nianfei Rebellion of 1853 to 1868. The two Dongan rebellions in 1862 to 1877 and 1895 to 1896, the Boxer Rebellion of 1900 to 1901, the Wuchang Uprising of October to December 1911, and then for wars, the First Opium War of 1839 to 1842, the Second Opium War of 1856 to 1860, and the First Sino Japanese War of 1894 to 1895. Wow. We're talking about a complex time period. Almost all of those were rebellions, 
And there are still more rebellions, they just were too small for the authors to name, because they would have had to write for decades. That's a pretty nice list, to say the least. Each one of these events gets about a paragraph or page of summarization. Yeah, only that. The first part of the book is actually the shortest part, because Osprey Publishing, honestly, is more focused on, al like, on actual military sp specifics. So what do I mean by that? Uh, the second part is on this, and I'll list it as easily as I can, because I would be here forever. So we have the armies, which consists of the Army of the Eight Banners from 1840 to 1911, the Green Standard Battalions, Yijing, of 1840 to 1911, the Brave Battalions, Yongying, of 1860 to 1911, the Modernized Armies of 1894 to 1903, then the New Army, the Luchun, of 1901 to 1911, the character of the Imperial Army, Corruption, and Foreign Advisors. Each roughly gets about a page of description, and this is followed by after, Infantry Weapons, 1840 to 1895, Artillery, 1840 to 1895, Infantry Weapons, 1895 to 1911, Machine Guns, Artillery, 19, 1895 to 1911, Uniforms and Equipment, 1840 to 1900, Identification Patches, Winter Uniforms, Equipment, 1840 to 1900, Modernized Uniforms, 1894 to 1911, New Army Uniforms and Equipment, 1903 to 1911, Ranks and Insignia, 1840 to 1911, and finally, Flags, 1840 to 1911. Wow, quite a list. All of which get anywhere from about a large paragraph to two pages of description each. Like I said, this is a lot more about just the strict military stuff. So as you can see, uh, it's over two thirds of the book is dedicated to actual equipment, weapons, clothing, flags of the Qing Dynasty's military. It's no, no small feat. I have to say, edu being educated in this myself quite recently, it's, a, it's an enormous mess and it's really hard to summarize. The Qing Dynasty had so many vastly different military structures which were disorganized over countless provinces and it's actually a marvel that anyone had the courage to make this book. The descriptions are amazingly simple, short and accompanied usually with artwork or an actual photo to give you a more, the more precise look you need to understand it. Uh, take it from me, if you're looking up a specific uh, Chinese jimmy-rigged musket rifle from the 19th century, it really helps to find it in an Osprey publishing book. Now, if you were looking for a long historic narrative, Osprey publishing books is absolutely not what you want. Uh, these books basically are almost completely directed at just tactics, strategy of a military, like I said, the clothing, the equipment and everything, they really want to summarize the events, but they are more concerned with everything having to do with just military structure. Um, for university students, you probably don't want to use many Osprey publishing books unless you're looking to describe weapons, clothing, equipment, or overall military structure. It's, uh, it's not a knock on the books, Personally, I do love them, but they don't explain they, they don't explain the in depth of like the the significance of certain events. And as undergrads, you know, particularly, it's your job to discover that. That's what your thesis is. You know, you're trying to find the significance about a certain event or place and how this you know changed something in the future. Um, Osprey though can be used for preliminary research. You know, because it's a good place to start as a summarization. And uh, you can accompany this with other primary and secondary sources. So I would always use it. You can still cite from it. it it's a good place to start. For the general public, uh, these books are absolutely fantastic for numerous reasons. They are extremely short reads, roughly about 50 pages to 100. Um, they summarize vastly complex periods or events without confusing the audience. So you can literally jump into, uh, let's say, the Taiping Rebellion having no background in Chinese history. It's rather nice. It's a very, very complicated matter. They are accompanied by amazing artwork and the photos really do showcase what things look like at the time. They get right to the point, uh, that being the military aspect of it. You pick, you can just pick up the book and you know exactly what you're getting off the bat. Often when you're reading an Osprey publishing book, uh, particularly the Men in Arms series, it'll recommend uh, another book that's similar to it from Osprey's collection, 
uh, such as with Imperial Chinese Armies 1840 to 1911. It overlaps with another publishing by Osprey, which is Men at Arms series 275, The Taiping Rebellion of 1855 to 1866. Um, I could make some other recommendations uh, for books. Obviously, I would recommend another Osprey publication. Um, like I said, the Taiping Rebellion book is uh, it's very good. I, I recently read it because I'm preparing for uh, an episode on the Taiping Rebellion. And uh, it, it's, it's great, honestly, for understanding the weaponry because um, just, you know, if you're reading a narrative-driven book, they'll overlook that often. It's not something that's significant, you know. What was the exact flintlock, flintlock mo model versus the other musket model? How did this influence the battle per se? You know, it's it's these cool things to know. I would also recommend uh, by the same author, Rising Sun: The Japanese Army, 1931 to 1945. Uh, that being by Philip S. Jowett. It provides a photographic history, um, but unlike Osprey Publishing, it goes more into depth on the subject. Um. Honestly, you know, just in front of me, if you wanted a book that would go into more of a narrative and you weren't looking for just the military structure, of course, this is an old classic everyone would know with the old breed. Uh, I've uh, actually made an episode talking about sledge, not sludge, as someone once knocked on me for. That's a, that's a other good book, uh, but it's more of, you know, it's uh, it's story driven. Whereas this is just a strictly military book, a little bit dry as far as that's concerned. It doesn't go too much into the stories. Uh, I hope you like this book review. Uh, please leave in the comments how I could do better because I'm blind, blindly doing these. I've never done these before. And I have a hell of a lot more books to do, so get used to seeing these. I, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, please leave a like and or subscribe if you can. And this has been the Pacific War Channel. Over and out.